Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Come on, come on, it's not that early. My name's Michelle Herzog. I'm with the Los Angeles County Office of Education, and I'm so thrilled to be back for our 14th, 14 years we've been doing this, 14th annual Constitution Day Conference. Big hand. And we're just so thrilled to see our returning folks who's been here before for this event. Awesome. And who's our new friends who are here for the first time? Awesome. And who's coming back next year? All hands, all hands. Awesome. That's great. Anyway, we could not do this without great partners and friends. You know, any big job can't be done alone. We're so grateful to the Ronald Reagan Foundation that's led by our wonderful director over here, Tony Penny. You'll hear from him in a minute. Thank you, Tony, and to the Reagan Foundation. Uh, we're grateful to the Arcelin Program, who helps fund a lot of this and provides the stipends for you. Big hand for Christian Linke and Arcelin. The other members of our team, Maria Gallo is here representing the Center for Civic Education. Yay! And Damon Huss, who's still at the registration table, hurriedly helping with all the registration at Constitutional Rights Foundation. Big hand for them, too. So we have another wonderful day in store for you. Lots of great breakouts, a great, some great speakers, lots of exhibitors. How many of you are members of California Council for the Social Studies? Okay, I'm not seeing that many hands. How many are going to join today? All hands, all hands, all hands. Come over here and get a form and join your, your statewide organization that supports social studies. Did you raise your hand, Steve? Okay, good. I'm watching that. Okay. So, terrific day. If you're not on my LACO listserv, please put your email and name on the blue sheet out there so you can get news and information about another great event coming up on March 9th at Azusa Pacific. Mark Romberg, what's it called again? Where'd he go? History Day. Yeah, so that's up and ready to go. Lots of cool stuff. All right, listen, thank you for coming. Quick reminder, you've all signed in. Um, in order to be eligible for your stipend, you need to sign out at the end of the day. So don't forget that. So we have that record. Okay. So now I want to quickly turn over to Christian Linke, who's going to give you a very short welcome as well. And then we'll move on with our program. Thank you, Christian. Big hand for Christian. <laughs> there you go, man. Right. Well, I'd, I'd like to take, oh, yeah. I'd like to take this moment to welcome you to our 14th annual Constitution Day. It seems really kind of uh, intimidating that it's our, our 14th annual. But then again, when I woke up this morning and felt the 14 years in my lower back, I realized that it has in fact been 14 years that I've been working with uh, Michelle on this project. And I think that it's one of my favorite activities of the year and, I, and we've watched it grow from a small event in Pasadena to a really large event here at the Reagan Library that gets teachers from all over Southern California and uh, has just a great array of speakers. And as you all know, I'm the one who begins with the inspirational bad news, uh, is the way that I like to look at it each year, talking about the state of, of young people and their participation in the political process, right? Because that's my job and our job at the Arslan program is we want to encourage young people to participate in the political process and in their communities. And as we all know, young people don't participate in the political process or in their communities. In fact, to, to highlight it, I just wanted to let you know that only about 19% of young people today, and this is the lowest of any generation, have any desire to run for office at any time in the future. Right? There's kids that are in school today right now. But a big part of the reason for this is that as a society, as Americans, we are in our private lives less democratic than we once were. We don't participate in democratic institutions. Think about your own private lives, the clubs that you participate in, and I don't mean political clubs. I mean clubs that have democratic norms where you use Robert's Rules of Order to process information and go through things. Young people used to do this kind of activity all the time and they don't do it as much anymore. Yes, their lives are filled with extracurricular activities like music. I know my daughters are playing violin and piano. They play sports, soccer, but fewer of them are in student government and even fewer are in things like the school paper, newspapers as we know are dying, or participating in nonpartisan academic clubs that had these kind of democratic norms where they would decide to do some activity using these 
norms. And this is very different than, say, Alec de Tocqueville when he described America in the mid-19th century. He said that children in their games are wont to submit rules that they have themselves established and to punish misdemeanors which they themselves have defined. That kids were inventing their own games. Kids do this naturally, but they did so according to kind of democratic principles. Whereas today, what we see in democratic practice or where we see democratic practice is online. And the kind of democracy we get online, and these were just three examples I thought were funny. We have in the UK, okay, it's not England, we have Bodie McBoatface, which was the official name of a scientific vessel voted on by the British public to be the name of an exploratory vessel. Um, the government rejected that name, it's the Sir David Attenborough, but the small submersibles on it are named Bodie McBoatface. We have uh, the rapper Pitbull had allowed Walmart to do a project with him where he agreed to go anywhere his fans wanted him to go to perform a concert for free. So he was sent to the most remote Walmart in Alaska. <laughs> right? And we recently, just this week, found out that the Mobile Bay Bears, that's a double-A baseball team attached to the Los Angeles Angels, are now the Rocket City Trash Pandas. Right? These are things that are all decided democratically, but not through normal democratic norms. Right? They didn't go through processes that are constraining of mass democracy like our Constitution itself does. Right? Our Constitution creates a system that is democratic, but gets to hopefully, more actually democratic norms. We don't end up voting Taco Bell as the best Mexican restaurant in the United States <laughs> because we have Senate committees and House committees that are, that are recommended in the Constitution that first then determine what the set of, let's say, Mexican restaurants would be to decide on. The Senate itself constrains the mass public voting of the House of Representatives. The president is elected in a in a not democratic way in the sense of a public vote, but each state with disproportionate states like Nevada and Wyoming having more say because they would have less say otherwise, right? I come from Nevada, so I'm one of those rare people who, because I don't want all of the nuclear waste in the United States to be buried in Nevada, like the Electoral College. But I, I do understand that it is an undemocratic but constitutional device, and we are filled with these but these undemocratic in the small d sense or in the mass sense are democratic in their ends because they create democratic norms. They teach us to deliberate and communicate with one another and that's one of the things that our constitution fosters and it's one of the things that we talk about here today that I hope some of our lessons come in today to talk about. The Arslan program has sponsored a number of people who will be giving presentations on the importance of voting in the classroom. Do I see Teresa here somewhere, Teresa Hudak? Oh, okay. Uh, Teresa Hudak from USC, there she is, is uh, going to be here. Um, and the Kalis program has offered a number of ways of looking at things. They're our partners. Uh, please do make sure that you visit the SCSSA. They are one of those great democratic institutions that I'm talking about. Their membership is on the rise, but it had been on the decline for a, for a good period of time, and that's the kind of organization that we need. We have great resources here for you today. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm honored that the Reagan Library lets us be here every year, and I'd like to take this moment to thank Tony Penny and bring him up to the stage with our final welcoming remarks today. Thanks, Tony. Thank you very much, sir. All right, good, er good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Tony, as, uh, as we mentioned already. Uh, and on behalf of our entire team here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, I want to welcome you to Constitution Day 2018. And all the partners have been thanked repeatedly, but one partner who uh, Michelle forgot to mention was herself. So Michelle, queen of social studies, thank you for all you do for us. <laughs> So uh, September 17th is going to mark the 231st anniversary of the signing of the Constitution. 31 years ago, during remarks at the bicentennial celebration of the Constitution, President Reagan said, and I quote, active and informed citizens are vital to the effective functioning of our constitutional system. All of us have an obligation to study the Constitution and participate actively in the system of self-government that it establishes. This is an obligation we owe not only to ourselves, but to our children and their children, uh, end quote. So as educators and as citizens, we embrace that responsibility. That's why we're here today. So uh, 
so much so that even early in the school year, for many of us, I think we're still in the first month or month and a half or so of the school year, when there's more than ample temptation to just kind of lie in your bed on a Saturday morning, uh, I want to thank all of you for investing, I'm not saying giving up, for investing a Saturday uh, in Constitution Day. So thank you all for, for waking up early and for being here today. So I'm going to introduce our keynote, but before we do, I want to remind us that uh, Constitution Day, it, it's serious, but it can also be fun, and so I'm going to give you top 10 pieces of constitutional trivia. I'm going to go fairly quickly, and there's prizes um, for some of them. Number 10, the U.S. Constitution has roughly 4,400 words. It is the oldest and shortest written constitution in any major government in the world. Number 9, among those 4,400 words, the word democracy does not appear once. Number eight, the oldest person to sign the Constitution was Ben Franklin at 81, the youngest, Jonathan Dayton of New Jersey at 26. This one's a question. There were only two future presidents who signed the Constitution. One was George Washington. Does anybody know who the other one is? First hand up. Sir? Thomas Jefferson, good guess, but no. Oh, hand. James Madison, jelly beans for you, sir. James Madison, here we go. Number six, jelly beans, the preferred treat of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. I get 10 cents every time I say that. Number six, there was a proposal at the Constitutional Convention to limit the standing army in the country to 5,000 or more, or, or 5,000 or less men. George Washington said, yes, this works as long as our enemies agree to max theirs out at 3,000. <clears> Number five, at the time of the Constitutional Convention, Philly was the most modern city in America and the largest city in North America with a population of 40,000 people. It also had 7,000 street lamps. It's awesome. Number four, distribution of the $5,000 bill ceased in 1969 for a thing of jelly beans. Which constitutional framer was on the $5,000 bill? James Madison. Yes, these are for you, sir. Come on down. Number three, and that's probably because you have a couple of them in your wallet, right, I'm guessing? Yeah. <laughs> Number three, of the 42 delegates who attended most of the meetings, only 39 actually signed the Constitution, with Edmund Randolph and George Mason of Virginia and Elbridge Jerry, famous for his mandering of Massachusetts, refused to sign because of the lack of a Bill of Rights. Number two, although Ben Franklin's mind was very active, his body was deteriorating and had to be carried to the convention hall in a sedan chair carried by four prisoners from the Walnut Street Jail every day. And last but not least, number one, there was only one delegate to attend every single meeting of the Constitutional Convention. Who was he? Somebody who hasn't answered yet? Washington, a good guess, but no. James Madison, yes, the answer to all three questions was James Madison. Jelly beans for James. That's, uh, that's what we're doing today. There we go. Ah, so the reason the answer to all three of those questions was James Madison is James Madison, arguably the father of the Constitution, uh, and has quite a bit to do with our keynote speaker who I'm going to introduce. So Julie Silverbrook is the executive director of the Constitutional Sources Project, which is a nonprofit devoted to educating lawyers, judges, teachers, and students about U.S. constitutional history. Prior to leading the Consource Project, she was the founding director of an award-winning constitutional literacy program called Constitutional Conversations. In collaboration with the Institute of the Bill of Rights Law, uh, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, and the Williamsburg Regional Library System. She's given lectures and presentations on the Constitution at a number of colleges and universities, including George Washington University, William and Mary, the University of Baltimore, the University of Virginia, and State Bar and Social Studies Associations. In 2015, she helped launch the National Constitution Literacy Campaign, and she holds a JD from William and Mary Law, Sc uh, Law School, where she received the National Association of Women Lawyers Award and the Thurgood Marshall Award, and served as a senior articles editor on the William and Mary Bill of Rights Journal. Uh, so, assuming all goes well, she's, we're connecting with her remotely. She has another event that involves a Supreme Court justice coming up very soon, and she's based on the East Coast, so she's not able to fly out, be here in person. But it looks like there she is, so if we could give her the signal that we are ready to go. Julie. Thank you for that generous introduction. Uh, before I get started, can everyone hear me? Perfect. Okay. 
Well, greetings from Washington, D.C. I'm really sorry I can't be with all of you in person, but I'm very pleased to be speaking with you virtually this morning. I'd like to begin my talk with an overview of why it's so important to study and understand the Constitution, and then I'm going to discuss a number of major contemporary constitutional issues, many of which you've read about in the news or on Twitter, and I'm going to put them into historical context. So let me start with a story that most, if not all of you, have already heard, which is that at the end of the Constitutional Convention, Benjamin Franklin was approached by a woman who asked him what sort of government the delegates had created. Franklin famously replied, a republic, if you can keep it. To keep it, our citizens actually have to know about it. And unfortunately, as many of you know all too well, the American people know shockingly little about even the most basic elements of our government and the Constitution that formed it. Our colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania's Annenberg Public Policy Center released a poll last year, and I believe they just released a new one uh, yesterday, showing just how little Americans know about the Constitution. They found, for example, that more than one in three people, 37%, could not name a single right protected by the First Amendment. Only one in four, 26%, can name all three branches of government. And one in three, 33%, can't name any branch of government, none, not even one. I think it's fairly extraordinary there are only three. <laughs> That to me, that's, that really underscores where we are uh, in, with civic knowledge in this country. Why does this matter? The grand experiment in self-government in this country only works if our citizens are informed and engaged. If you feel anxious about the future of this country, part of this has to do with the civic literacy and engagement crisis that we face and that you as civics teachers know all too well in your own classrooms. But I'm actually really hopeful uh, because people are talking about the Constitution and civics education now. The Constitution is in the news for better or worse every day. Uh, I believe people are ready to significantly increase our nation's current investment in not only K through 12 civic learning, but also lifelong civic learning. I wanna spend the bulk of today's talk putting some of today's major constitutional issues into context while also directing all of you to valuable resources for teaching your students about these issues, many of which are complex, challenging, and at times politically fraught. We are going to cover a lot of ground this morning. I recognize that it's early, so buckle up. I think you're gonna enjoy uh, our little tour de force of a few constitutional issues. Here's what I plan to cover, uh, the separation of powers, constitutional norms and rules, and presidential removal from office. I, I feel like that's in the news a little bit uh, today. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to start with a discussion of the separation of powers. So in the Trump era, there is a great deal of anxiety about the powers of the president vis-a-vis -vis the other branches of government. There is a renewed interest in seeing Congress take back some of the power it has ceded to the office of the president over time, and in seeing the judicial branch keep the president's actions consistent with the rule of law and constitution. I wanna note though, uh, that separation of powers concerns are not new to this particular administration. Questions of checking presidential power go all the way back to the first presidential administration of George Washington. I want to start with a historic overview of the separation of powers and why it matters. It's important to note, however, that the term separation of powers appears nowhere in the text of the Constitution. Uh, in the U.S.'s first foray into collective self-governance under the Articles of Confederation, uh, a lot of the powers uh, that were given uh, to the national government uh, proved insufficient uh, for governing the nation. So when they convened in Philadelphia, the Constitutional Convention delegates fashioned a new government blueprint um, and the constitution they unveiled uh, 231 years ago on Monday authorized considerably more federal power, but the framers were cautious 
revolutionary. So in the, although they expanded federal power, uh, they were very cautious about issues uh, related to the concentration of power. In Federalist Number 51, uh, which you can read on the Consource website, James Madison described the concentration of sovereign power as, the, and I quote, the very definition of tyranny. And so the delegates decided to divide authority among a legislative, executive, and judicial branch. For Madison, and again, I quote, the great security against a gradual concentration of the several powers in the same department consists in giving to those who administer each department the necessary means and personal motives to resist encroachments of the others. Thus, no one branch on its own could dominate. The framers did more than simply divide power among three groups. They endowed each group with distinct dispositional, political, and institutional characteristics. And they made each group answerable to different sets of constituencies and subject to different temporal demands. Because of these differing characteristics, bases of accountability and time horizons within which to work, the branches were expected to harbor conflicting agendas. These conflicts would in turn sharpen institutional rival rivalries, enlarge and improve federal decision making, and of course impede the consolidation of federal power for potentially abusive or tyrannical ends. If we go back even farther, uh, then the Constitutional Convention, you can see why separation of powers is so important to the founding generation. In the colonial period, uh, this generation had experience with overly powerful executives uh, through the both its relationship with the crown and also uh, the royal governors uh, in uh, many of the colonies and judges that were answerable only to a distant crown. Uh, this led to uh, the creation of almost unfettered state legislatures in uh, sort of the post-revolutionary period when states developed their own systems of government independent from the crown. After only a decade of experience with those legislatures, Madison, among many others, concluded, and again I quote, the legislative department is everywhere extending the sphere of its activity and drawing all power into its impetuous vortex. And although fears of both an imperial present president and an overreaching judiciary began early, there have been periods of American history which the, where the great uh, constitutional fear was actually an overly powerful Congress. It's safe to say today that we are not living in such a period, uh, nor have we been for some time. The question I often get is what can Congress do to cabin the power of the executive, especially given the fact that the president can veto legislation? Well, of course, as you all know, uh, per the text of the Constitution, Congress can override a presidential veto with supermajorities in both houses. Uh, but that's difficult to achieve, especially in today's polarized uh, political climate. So what other mechanisms does Congress have in place? The courts have judicial review. So, so what does Congress have? Congress has both hard and soft powers. The hard powers you know, so I'm going to start with the soft powers. So in many cases, the Constitution deliberately leaves the resolution of substantive issues to what I'll call constitutional politics. In doing so, it embodies a judgment that government will do better when the constitutional structure of government creates the opportunity for interbranch tension and conflict. This space for conflict allows the branches to compete publicly for the affections of the people in a manner that increases representativeness, reduces the risk of one branch asserting tyrannical control over the nation, and promotes healthy deliberation as to the public good. Part of this process of competition must involve a deliberative engagement with the citizenry. That is, each branch must make its case in the public sphere. And this is where each branch's soft power must come into play. A branch that consistently loses the public relations war will find itself consistently losing power. Does anybody know which branch of government has the lowest approval rating? Congress. So you can see why they're in a little, they've been a little in a little bit of trouble uh, over the last couple of years. 
But we do see Congress asserting its soft power um, over major issues. Uh, you see this with Democrats right now taking on immigration and President Trump's federal court nominees in the court of public opinion as we speak. Uh, in the Obama administration, uh, Republicans in Congress were similarly very vocal about the perceived dangers of the Affordable Care Act and balancing religious liberty issues against those relating to birth control and marriage equality. Congress also has hard powers, which we know about uh, because they're explicitly spelled out in the text of the Constitution. They include the power of the purse, the contempt power, the impeachment power, which I'll discuss in detail later, and the Senate's power to advise and consent on the appointment of federal judges, something that's unfolding right now with Judge Brett Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court. On the latter power, we saw Congress exercise this, rightly or wrongly, to deny former President Obama the opportunity to appoint Judge Merrick Garland to the U.S. Supreme Court. To me, this was actually a really significant moment in the history of the Congress. Um, and again, with reserving judgment on whether it was the right or wrong thing to do, what this moment did show was the ability of Congress to flex its muscles to deny the president opportunity to appoint a Supreme Court justice that serves for lifetime tenure. This leads me to the third branch of government, the judiciary, which happens to be the branch of government with the highest approval rating. Uh, we happen to live in a time of, of great anxiety about the rule of law, not just in the United States, but around the world. Uh, recent comments by the president raise a number of questions about what would occur if the president were to order government officials to defy a judicial ruling. The idea that the Supreme Court has ultimate authority in matters of constitutional interpretation, which often rides under the heading of judicial supremacy, has acquired strong currency with the American public. Um, a poll that came out yesterday from the Annenberg Public Policy Center uh, underscores that most Americans think that the idea that the Supreme Court speaks authoritatively and finally uh, is a good thing uh, and a good feature of our constitutional system. In the history of American political ideas, judicial supremacy has eclipsed what is known as departmentalism. Departmentalism is the theory that each branch of government should interpret the Constitution for itself. Today, um, as the Annenberg poll uh, underscored, the rule of law, most people think the rule of law requires judicial supremacy. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, the court itself has promoted judicial supremacy and associated, with, associated it with the rule of law. For example, in the case of Cooper v. Aaron, the court declared it to be a basic principle for our constitutional order that the federal judiciary is supreme in the exposition of the Constitution. The court says that it said in that case that it follows that its interpretations of the Constitution are the supreme law of the land, binding on other officials who have taken oaths to uphold the Constitution. The court has also associated judicial supremacy with the requirements of the rule of law in a number of other decisions, including United States v. Nixon, which held that a court could compel the president to surrender tapes of Oval Office conversations. Historically, however, claims of judicial supremacy have provoked contestation. During the early years of US history, it was widely believed that each branch or department of government should interpret the Constitution for itself without any branch's interpretation necessarily binding the others. Thomas Jefferson, for example, held this position for all of his life. At the present moment, departmentalism not only strikes many of us as terrifying, but also contravenes our own intuitions about the rule of law. At the very least, we may think the rule of law requires presidential acquiescence to the principles of judicial finality, which holds that a judicial decision conclusively resolves the disputes between the parties to a case, even if one of those parties is a president. Our system of government, however, is not, nor has it ever been one of pure judicial supremacy. Presidents have defied or credibly threatened to defy judicial rulings in the past. One famous example is when Andrew Jackson famously said in response to the court's opinion in Worcester v. Georgia, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. 
Presidents may do likewise in the future. Um, moreover, it would be a mistake to say categorically that such presidential conduct is inherently unconstitutional or necessarily incompatible with the ideal of the rule of law. If we can kind of get beyond the either or, cho either or choice between judicial supremacy and departmentalism, it would be most accurate to say that judicial review in the U United States operates within politically constructed bounds. When the court speaks, they normally speak authoritatively, but that is because courts normally speak about uh, matters and only matters uh, and in ways that are politically acceptable for them to speak about at particular times. Our current Chief Justice is, uh, John Roberts, is particularly concerned with preserving the integrity, the institutional and political integrity um, of the court you can often see in his opinions that he's trying to strike a middle ground that will be palatable for a wide swath of the American public. But we can imagine a scenario whereby the majority of Americans might find a court opinion that was clearly unconstitutional and would support the president, Congress, and the states defying that ruling on those grounds. Uh, I'll give you a sort of off the wall hypothetical that I think would never happen, but if the court were to decide that there's a constitutional mandate to discriminate on the basis of gender, right, we would be, we would really be asking Congress, the president and the states to defy a ruling that we think clearly violates the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment. I wanna close out the separation of powers discussion by referencing one of my favorite quotes from Judge Learned Hand on the importance of citizens in embracing the rule of law and the promotion and protection of promotional freedom. He says, I wonder whether we do not rest our hopes too much upon constitutions, upon laws, and upon courts. These are false hopes, believe me, these are false hopes. Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. This is why what all of you do every day is so, 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 so important. It also leads me to my next, talk, my next topic, uh, which is the difference between uh, constitutional norms and rules. As Tony said in his intro, American constitutionalism is famously about written rules. Our constitutions, both the federal constitution and state constitutions are filled with them. While constitutional rules and their interpretation and enforcement are of course important, they do not exhaust our constitutional practice. Perhaps as important as written constitutional rules to the maintenance of a free republic are the unwritten constitutional norms, practices, and conventions that guide and constrain political behavior. Those unwritten constitutional norms are less transparent than the explicit words of the written constitutional text and are less likely to feature in judicial opinions, for example, but they are fundamental elements of our historic constitutional practice. Part of the purpose of the text of the constitution is to assign discretionary powers over specified subjects to designated government officials, just as I discussed before regarding separation of powers. Such discretion may simply go unchecked by constitutional rules and norms, but it might also be circumscribed by evolving expectations on how such power is to be properly used. A classic example of this was the tradition of the two-term presidency. Uh, it, this is, of course, a tradition that was started by George Washington, but the progressive era saw this tradition called into question, first with Teddy Roosevelt's effort to serve a third term, and of course with FDR serving more than two terms. The question was ultimately settled through the adoption of a written rule in the form of a constitutional amendment. This is something that can always happen. You can transform a constitutional norm into a codified formal rule. Um, either you, you can either do this uh, most authoritatively by amending the Constitution, um, although we know that's relatively difficult uh, to do. Uh, we only have 27 amendments, and we actually got 11 of them uh, all uh, right, sort of right away in the in the early 1790s. Um, or you can have it codified in a statute, uh, which of course could be overturned over time. Partisanship and self-interest can generate significant political pressure that inherited constitutional norms might struggle to contain. 
So when political elites are no longer willing to defend constitutional norms or, or unable or unwilling to punish those who violate them, the norms will eventually collapse. Allegations of norm violations have intensified in recent years as levels of polarization have increased and members of both parties have resorted to what scholars call constitutional hardball. An example, again, is when the Senate refused to hold a hearing for President Obama's Supreme Court nominee, Merrick Garland. As history demonstrates, though, constitutional norms are perpetually in flux, and because they are norms and not codified rules, they can be in flux. The principal source of instability is not that the norms can be disregarded by politicians who deny their legitimacy, their validity, or their values, although this does happen sometimes, and you might see this happening today. But rather, the principal source of instability is that constitutional norms can be dynamically interpreted in more or less restrictive ways and at a higher or lower level of generality. And the potential for such reinterpretation puts ongoing pressure on the integrity of the norms and their capacity to constrain the conduct of government officials. It is imperative, and this is why what all of you do is so important, that citizens understand both constitutional norms and values as well as rules so they can in turn elect public officials that respect them and vote uh, those out who are disrespecting them while they're in office. On this important function of pushing those public officials out of office who are violating constitutional rules and norms and in light of the enormous amount of press attention uh, on this constitutional question, I wanted to spend some time this morning talking about impeachment and presidential removal from office. Uh, impeachment has been uh, one of the most searched constitutional questions uh, since, I will say, early November 2016. <laughs> uh, but it should be noted that impeachment threats are present in almost every presidency. Uh, this occurred during President Obama's tenure as president as well. Uh, numerous members of the Republican Party raised that Obama had engaged in a range of impeachable activities and that he might have faced attempts to remove him from office. Of course, that never got uh, to uh, a vote. So what is impeachment? Um, I get lots of questions about this, and I think uh, there's a lot of confusion, especially for young people. Uh, the impeachment process provides a very specific mechanism and that specific me mechanism is for the removal of the president, vice president, and other civil officers of the United States found to have engaged in treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. The Constitution places the responsibility and authority to determine whether to impeach an individual in the hands of the House of Representatives. At the time of the founding, this was the only house that was popularly elected. Should a simple majority of the House approve articles of impeachment specifying the grounds upon which the impeachment is based, the matter is then presented to the Senate, to which the Constitution provides the sole power to try an impeachment. A conviction on any one of the articles of impeachment requires the support of a two-thirds majority of the Senate, senators present, and the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court presides over impeachment trials. So we talked about separation of powers before. Impeachment is one of uh, the areas in the Constitution where you actually see uh, all three branches in some ways working in concert together. Should a conviction occur, the Senate retains limited authority to determine the appropriate punishment. Under the Constitution, the penalty for conviction on an impeachable offense is limited to either removal from office or removal and prohibition against holding any future offices of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. So this is really important. This is not a criminal proceeding impeachment. This is just to remove a public official from office. In our nation's history, the House has impeached 19 individuals. And when I use the term impeached, I mean that the House of Representatives voted uh, in favor of impeachment, and then it goes to the Senate for trial. Um, so uh, you would have to be convicted uh, in order to actually be removed from office. Um, of those 19 individuals, 15 were federal judges. 
uh, there was one senator, one cabinet member, and two presidents, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton. The Senate has conducted 16 full impeachment trials. Of those, eight individuals, all of them federal judges, were convicted by the Senate. So let's get into what people are talking about today. The Constitution describes the grounds of impeachment as treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. While treason and bribery are relatively well-defined terms, the meaning of the language high crimes and misdemeanors is not defined in the Constitution or in statute, and it remains somewhat opaque. This language was actually adopted from the English practice of parliamentary impeachments, which appears to have been directed against individuals accused of crimes against the state and encompassed offenses beyond traditional criminal law. Some have argued that only criminal conduct uh, can be the basis of an impeachable offense under the Constitution, and that impeachment is therefore inappropriate for non-criminal activity. In support of this assertion, one might note that the debate on impeachable offenses during the Constitutional Convention in 1787 indicates that criminal conduct was encompassed by the language high crimes and misdemeanors. The notion that only criminal conduct can constitute sufficient grounds for impeachment does not, however, comport with historical practice. Alexander Hamilton of Broadway fame uh, in the Federalist Number 65, in justifying the placement of the power to try impeachments in the Senate, described impeachable offenses as arising from, and I quote, the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. He went on to say that such offenses were political as they relate chiefly to injuries done immediately to the society itself. According to this reasoning, impeachable conduct could include behavior that violates an official's duty to the country, even if such conduct is not necessarily a prosecutable offense in a criminal proceeding. Indeed, in, both, uh, in the past, both houses of Congress have given the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors a broad reading, finding that impeachable offenses need not be limited to criminal conduct. A variety of congressional materials support this reading, for example, committee reports on potential grounds for impeachment have described the history of English impeachment as including non-criminal conduct and noted that this tradition was adopted by the framers. In accordance with the understanding of high offenses in the English tradition, impeachable offenses are considered constitutional wrongs that subvert the structure of government or undermine the integrity of office and even the Constitution itself. Other high crimes and misdemeanors are not limited, again, to indictable offenses, but apply to serious violations of the public trust. High crimes and misdemeanors are thus best characterized as misconduct that damages the state and operations of governing institutions. So, as I said, uh, impeachment, uh, the purpose of it, uh, indicates that non-criminal activity may constitute sufficient grounds for impeachment, the purpose of impeachment is not to inflict personal punishment on an individual for criminal activity. In fact, the Constitution explicitly makes clear that impeached individuals are not immunized from criminal liability once they are impeached for a particular activity. Instead, impeachment is a remedial tool. It serves to effectively maintain constitutional government by removing individuals unfit for office. Grounds for impeachment include abuse of the particular powers of government office or a violation of public trust, conduct that is unlikely to be barred via statute. So I want to recap. Impeachable conduct does not appear to be limited to criminal behavior. Congress has identified three general types of conduct that constitute grounds for impeachment, although these categories are not exhaustive. They include improperly exceeding or abusing the powers of the office, behavior incompatible with the function and purpose of the office and misusing the office for an improper purpose for, or for personal gain. Um, I had not originally planned to talk about the 25th Amendment this morning, uh, but I feel like that the fact that it's been in the news uh, pretty much every day for the last two weeks, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, talk about it with you. Um, I think it's worth digging into the text and then trying to put the amendment in to context. Before we dig in, I do want to say that I personally believe that the 25th Amendment is poorly worded, at times confusing, and potentially dangerous 
in operation. With that caveat, let's dig in to the text. So I'm going to start with section one, which says, in the case of the, re of the removal of the president from office or of his death or resignation, the vice president shall become president. This is pretty straightforward. It essentially revisits Article Two of the Constitution that sets up from the beginning that the vice president takes over if the president dies or is unable to serve, but with clearer language to clean up any uh, previous confusion. When William Henry Harrison died shortly after his inauguration in 1841, there were questions about whether John Tyler nicknamed his accidency uh, was truly the president or just an acting president of some kind. Uh, Tyler made clear that he intended to fully occupy the office of a president and do everything uh, that a pre an elected president would have done. Since then, seven presidents have taken office after a presidential death, all before the 25th Amendment was ratified, and one after a resignation. In this way, the amendment uh, did what we talked about before, which is it codified a constitutional uh, norm into a explicit uh, constitutional rule. Section two says, whenever there is a vacancy in the office of the vice president, the president shall nominate a vice president who shall take office upon confirmation by a majority vote of both houses of Congress. Before this, if the vice president became president, there was no vice president. From taking the oath of office in November 1963 until Hubert Humphrey, uh, until he and Hubert Humphrey were sworn in after winning election in 1964, Lyndon Johnson actually had no vice president. This section of the 25th Amendment has been invoked twice. One, when Spiro Agnew resigned in 1973 and Richard Nixon chose Gerald Ford to replace him, and when Ford succeeded Nixon as president in 1974 and chose Nelson Rockefeller as his vice president. Section three of the 25th uh, Amendment says, whenever the president transmits to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives his written declaration that he is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. And until he transmits to them a written declaration to the contrary, such powers and duties shall be discharged by the vice president as acting presidents. This section seems like it should be pretty straightforward. It was invoked without controversy twice in the early 2000s when President George W. Bush signed over power to Vice President Dick Cheney for a few hours during sedation for routine uh, medical procedure, but it can actually get a little fuzzy, this provision of the 25th Amendment. Uh, for example, this provision of the 25th Amendment wasn't invoked when Ronald Reagan was shot in 1981, despite the fact that the White House physician at the time kept a copy of the amendment in his bag. Uh, Bill Clinton didn't formally put Section 3 provisions in place when he had knee surgery in 1997, saying that he never uh, was never under general anesthesia. However, Clinton's press secretary indicated that the chief of staff had been in close contact with then Vice President Al Gore's staff in case, and I quote, anything about the 25th Amendment is indicated. Things start to get really fuzzy in Section 4, and this is what people are talking about today. The first paragraph reads, whenever the vice president and a majority of either the principal officers of the executive departments or of such other body as Congress may by law provide, transmit to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives their written declaration that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the vice president shall immediately assume the powers and duties of the office as acting president. Here's where we transition from historical explanation to future speculation. This section has never been invoked, and it has a number of ambiguous phrases that leave it open to a range of possibilities. For starters, who exactly gets to decide the president isn't able to serve? The conventional interpretation of the amendment is that it needs to be the vice president plus a majority of the cabinet. So let's keep in mind that the only person elected in that situation is the vice president on the same ticket as the president. Cabinet are appointed nominees, are appointed individuals. They were not elected. Further, what does unable to discharge powers and duties of the office mean and who gets to provide the definition? 
the context for the 25th Amendment was pretty clearly aimed at the kinds of physical and mental incapacities that come after strokes, heart attacks, and being shot. Uh, it was in response to Woodrow Wilson's stroke, Dwight Eisenhower's heart attack, and John F. Kennedy's assassination, and the related worry um, about what would happen if uh, Kennedy had actually survived the shooting but been incapacitated um, since he was shot in the head. Uh, this all informed the debate about the amendment, but there's nothing in the text that actually requires a formal diagnosis. So what does this mean now? This could end up being a test of the authority of the cabinet, which again is unelected, uh, because the amendment empowers the cabinet to take this action. There's a lot of anxiety about invoking this provision of the 25th Amendment, and it is one of the things that gives me uh, pause when people talk about the 25th Amendment, because in some ways, it does kind of look like a palace coup um, if your cabinet uh, decides to say that uh, as president, you're unfit for office. The second paragraph of section four, if you can believe it, gets even more confusing. It says, thereafter, when the president transmits to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the speaker of the house, his written declaration that no inability exists, he shall resume the powers and duties of his office unless the vice president and a majority of either the principal officers of the executive department or of such other body as Congress may by law provide transmit within four days to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives their written declaration that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. Thereupon, Congress shall decide the issue, assembling within 48 hours for that purpose, if not in session. In other words, the 25th Amendment provides a way for the president to respond to accusations of a lack of fitness. And this is where things get really interesting. After the president offers a declaration that he or she is able to serve, the cabinet has four days to object and respond. But who gets to be president during that time? The text isn't really clear. It goes on to say, if the Congress within 21 days after receipt of the latter written declaration from the president, or if the Congress is not in session within 21 days after Congress is required to assemble, determines by two thirds vote of both houses that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of the office, the vice president shall continue to discharge the same as acting vice president, as acting president rather. Otherwise the president shall resume the powers and duties of his office. So many parts of the constitution are admittedly vague, uh, but this one really sets up the country for a pretty wild ride. Uh, constitutional scholar Brian Colt, uh, who has uh, studied this, um, points out obviously that section four, uh, section four is drafted less than perfectly. Uh, for him, the best reading of its text is that when the president declares he is able, he does not automatically retake power until either four days pass without the vice president and cabinet disagreeing, or if he, the president, wins the vote in Congress. But the text is ambiguous on this point, and commentators have frequently misread it as allowing the president to retake power immediately upon his declaration of ability. The provision of the amendment that everyone's been talking about is actually the one that we know the least about. Since the 25th Amendment was ratified, presidents, vice presidents, and White House officials of all political stripes have generally tread very cautiously around the provisions of Section 4. It seems fairly safe to say at this point that there are lingering legitimacy issues when it comes to members of the executive branch who are unelected, actually talking about removing a democratically elected president and replacing him or her with the vice president. And even under perfectly innocuous circumstances, presidents seem very reluctant to entertain the idea of being temporarily replaced under the amendments provisions. Now that's a lot of information uh, in a relatively short period of time, early in the morning, uh, for those of you in California. Um, and so I, I want to stop there and use the balance of my time uh, to direct you to some great resources to learn more about these issues and much more about the Constitution. And then I want to share a little bit about you with my, uh, about my process for um, how I assess a, a constitutional issue as it's unfolding. 
So here are, are some resources that I think you should check out. Uh, you should go to civicsrenewalnetwork.org. Uh, this is a hub uh, for lesson plans, curricular resources, games, uh, all kinds of amazing resources for teachers that are available uh, for free. Um, and they are from the nation's leading civic education organizations, including Consource, iCivics, the National Archive, Street Law, and many others. Um, if you're looking for primary source documents tracing the history of specific clauses of the Constitution or lesson plans that take you through major historical constitutional debates, including the drafting and ratification of the Constitution and Bill of Rights, I encourage you to visit consource.org. If you're looking for a great overview of contemporary constitutional issues, I highly recommend the National Constitution Center's Interactive Constitution and their Constitution Daily blog. And of course, if you're looking for video games, uh, there's no better place to check out than iCivics. I want to close out my talk before I take some questions from all of you um, just by reviewing the process I have uh, for when I try to understand a contemporary constitutional issue. So the first question I always ask myself is this, what does the relevant text of the Constitution say? So uh, in the news, people are talking about how do we remove the president from office? I look to the text and it takes me to two, it takes me to two sections, the section on impeachment and the 25th Amendment. Then I ask, what is the context in which it was written? Here, I tend to start uh, at, in the Consource Digital Library to look at the debates from the Constitutional Conventions, debates from state ratifying conventions, other treatises from the framers of uh, the Constitution. Uh, and uh, if it was a subsequent amendment, I'll instead look at uh, the legislative history of that amendment in Congress. The goal of this is to understand what was intended by the people drafting the text of either the Constitution itself or subsequent amendments, um, and to understand how these words uh, were understood at the time. Sometimes there are books and articles written on a topic that prove useful in summarizing this history. I believe Oxford University Press just released a very short introduction to uh, impeachment. And that's what it's called. It's a part of a series called Very Short Introductions. Um, and it's a very thin volume. I think it's only like five to ten dollars to, to purchase it. Um, but you can it gives you a really nice historical uh, overview. Once I've done that historical background re research, I ask, how has the text of the Constitution been interpreted over time? Here I look at Supreme Court cases. My friends at Street Law have great resources on landmark Supreme Court cases, as does Oye, spelled O-Y-E-Z, and Cornell's Legal Information Institute. But I look, also look at how Congress and the President have interpreted the clauses. Uh, the Congressional Research Service uh, which is essentially the research arm of the Library of Congress, provides great reports that often cover these topics. You can also look at the legislative history of major pieces of legislation on the Library of Congress's website. My next question is, what are the constitutional politics of this moment? And here, you have to read the news. You have to understand the issue at hand. And you have to think about why arguments are being raised. Are they being raised for political reasons? Are there real uh, constitutional questions underlying this uh, effort? You need to understand the incentives of the actors uh, to understand whether or not this is a valid constitutional argument uh, or one that's uh, potentially invalid and only being made for political gain. And then finally, I do what I call a constitutional gut check. So I ask myself, if this doesn't violate a formal rule, right, it doesn't explicitly violate the text of the Constitution, does it instead violate a constitutional norm? Is this something that we as citizens should be concerned about, right, this norm violation? Um, and that's how I go through and process every major constitutional issue as it comes up. It is time consuming, I, I will say, um, but uh, given what I do and what all of you do, I think it's a really good way uh, to make sure that you fully know where uh, you are and where the history is and where the contemporary political debates are on a particular constitutional issue before presenting it to your students. So we've covered a lot of ground there. I think I only have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to stop here and take any questions 
you might have. Don't be shy. All right, and then we're gonna ask if anybody has a question, if you, if you could raise your hand. We have a camera in the back just because she can't see you uh, unless, we, unless we're on camera. Uh, so if you have a question, my colleague Jeff is back there. If you don't mind going over to him, he's got a microphone in the camera, so you can look into the camera and that way uh, Julie can see you. So, uh, and then you can get coffee afterwards. Yeah, go. don't be shy. You're not shy, it's teachers. So we got a couple who are walking over there, Julie. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is, uh, it seems like in the Roberts era, a lot of the big decisions have been split, five, four decisions, oftentimes with Justice Kennedy being the swing vote. Uh, somebody who kind of had people on either side had decisions that they liked by him. So I was wondering what you think the impact of Kennedy stepping down will be as far as the integrity of the court and how people view the court. Um, so it's important to note that actually the vast majority of Supreme Court opinions are not five to four. Uh, most of them are seven to two or even unanimous. It just happens to be the ones that are uh, that gain media attention tend to be the controversial ones, and they do tend to be five to four. Um, undeniably, it's significant that Justice Kennedy is going to be replaced by a justice who is more conservative on a range of issues than he is. Um, what this means is that the Chief Justice, John Roberts, is now the swing justice. Um, and as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about separation of powers, John Roberts is very concerned about the institutional integrity of the court. Because uh, they know people follow uh, judicial rulings as long as judicial supremacy remains in vogue, right? Once people stop believing uh, in the court, which has really no enforcement power, that really undermines the role of the Supreme Court in the constitutional system. So I think John Roberts is keenly aware of that. Um, with that said, uh, you are going to see, uh, at least in uh, the, the short term and probably the long term, a more conservative bench generally. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if that helps you sleep at night. Probably not. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, if I understood what you were saying, and my colleague Barbara knows, I'm kind of a conspiracy-minded individual. I'm suspicious of the 25th Amendment. If President Reagan were president today, I'm asking you, do you think he would have been under a threat of impeachment given, say, for example, the Iran-Contra scandal, et cetera? Just like your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think, like I said, um, impeachment is a tool. Uh, that Congress has to check the power of the president and, and potentially to remove that individual from office. Impeachment threats exist in pretty much every presidency. Um, so uh, do I think uh, that A, impeachment was a possibility for Ronald Reagan during Iran-Contra? Yes, it obviously never moved that far. Um, I think uh, if something like that happened today, just because of social media and the 24-hour news cycle, there would possibly be more political pressure uh, to drive uh, Congress in the direction of uh, maybe bringing formal uh, articles of impeachment um, against President Reagan in that example, um, or really any uh, president. Again, there were uh, articles of impeachment that never got a vote uh, that were uh, drafted during the Obama years. Um, and uh, we know that there are currently articles of impeachment that have been drafted against uh, the president. Uh, unlikely to get a majority of the House of Representatives to sign on to that, given the current political composition um, of Congress. Uh, but that, of course, might change in a, a couple of months here, or uh, really a couple of weeks uh, after the midterm elections. Which is why, by the way, voting is really important. Hi, um, uh, I teach uh, high school history government and trying to make the Constitution come alive for the students. Um, what would you say would be the best Federalist Papers that you would discuss with students? And then is there a particular um, journalist or political people that you think would be best to take a look at or follow as a class with these current constitutional issues? Yeah. Great, great questions. I think Federalist 10 is uh, required reading. Uh, Federalist 78 um, 
on the separation of powers, if you look in the uh, Federalist numbers 50s, in the 50s and the 60s, that does a lot for separation of powers. I think that's really uh, valuable to take a look at. Um, in terms of journalists, gosh, this is just a really tough time, I think, uh, for finding uh, resources for students that are bipartisan or nonpartisan. Um, I do really recommend the National Constitution Center's Constitution Daily blog. They tend to do a pretty good job of presenting both sides of the argument. But what I would recommend for your students is they pick up the New York Times, or, you, or for you in presenting this, is you give them a New York Times article and you give them a Wall Street Journal article, or you give them a Washington Post article and you give them a National Review article, presenting both sides. Uh, because a lot of the Constitution, uh, are the way we interpret it, it, it exists in sort of an ambiguous gray area. Um, and so uh, it is a matter of interpretation and, and reasonable minds uh, and unreasonable minds for that matter can disagree um, over the meaning of the Constitution. So, so that's how I would uh, recommend it. And here's a great thing to do with your students, present it as a, an issue for conversation or debate. Um, I think that's exciting. What better way to make it come alive than say, okay, uh, today you get to be president, today you get to be the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, or you get to be the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, hash out this interbranch dispute. Tell me how you would how we would resolve it. Thank you very much for your presentation today. It's been fantastic. I, uh, my question is about evolving norms, and um, that could be a whole kind of philosophical discussion. But as we think about these constitutional issues, what are maybe some resources that you could suggest for? Um, thinking about how norms evolve over time and how to then, again, do some analysis on these topics. Uh, for example, you know, there was a time when the, the norm would have said there, you know, it doesn't make sense to have a female president, and yet we've evolved. So, uh, you know, it's important to look at the context of the norms as you talked about in your analysis, but then how do we s reach forward and incorporate evolving norms? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, let me say that on the question of constitutional norms generally, there's a great uh, relatively new book by Akhil Amar, who's a well-known constitutional scholar. I, if I wasn't on screen, I would go run. It's on my bookshelf to pick up. It's called Our Invisible Constitution, and it talks a little bit about those constitutional norms. Um, in terms of looking at how they've evolved over time, um, good book to look at is uh, Linda Monk's uh, book uh, on the Constitution. Um, it's embarrassing because she's a dear friend and I can't remember the name of it. I think it's called The Words We Live By, um, Our Constitution. And she kind of takes you through every clause and helps bring you forward uh, in terms of how it's been interpreted. It's a great resource. Uh, you can order it on Amazon. Um, the National Constitution Center's interactive constitution. Um, they're still completing that, but for what it, the content that's already up online, it talks a little bit about that. Um, and of course, you can go to Consource and look at where we were in 1787, 1791, during Reconstruction, and measure that against where we are now. Um, so the, there's no shortcut for assessing constitutional norms, um, but I would recommend really going through the process that I described to you, looking at the history, looking at how the text has been interpreted over time, and then thinking, you know, do we need to continue to evolve on this issue? So I think issues of equality, uh, that's an area where you're going to see a uh, continuing evolution. Um, although going to the, to the first question, um, you may see the Supreme Court take a step back um, on some issues that Justice Kennedy, uh, for example, is very uh, prominent in writing um, a number of opinions related to equality, most notably marriage equality, and the question of whether or not uh, the court would keep uh, to that Obergefell decision or narrow it in some way. Uh, but also keep in mind that uh, just because the court speaks doesn't mean about the federal constitution, uh, which sets the floor for constitutional rights, doesn't mean that state constitutions, which get almost no attention, uh, can't set a higher bar uh, for equality. Um, and so I would say, you know, look at what's happening in the states uh, as well. And that's part of this evolving constitutional dialogue as well. Do we have any other questions? Oh, yeah. 
There we go. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Um, so I have more of a question for folks that are marginalized. So a lot of the students I teach are women of color and women who are in the foster system, women who have been on probation. How as a teacher, as a government teacher, do I make the Constitution come alive for them, especially with America's history being so problematic with mar marginalized folks? Um, so how do I kind of teach my girls like that the Constitution really is designed and can be made for them and they can participate in it? I think what's super important is that we have to be honest about the fact that the Constitution as originally drafted and understood did not include women, did not include racial minorities. Um, and we have to be honest about that and deal with that in a very direct way. Uh, another way, I, and I think, I, you know, once you get that out and you talk about it, talk about how does that make your students feel? And let's then look at the arc of progress, right? I look at reconstruction and what came out of that. Uh, look at the 19th Amendment, which has a centennial uh, coming up, which is a great opportunity. Also, look at the ways in which racial minorities and women, uh, and even uh, non-landowning men, were influencing the debate over the Constitution. Mercy Otis Warren uh, was a person who wrote uh, a multi, the first multi-volume uh, uh, book on the American Revolution. Uh, she was a correspondent of major founders, including George Washington and John Adams. Uh, look at the letters between John and Abigail Adams. Uh, Abigail would often give John advice on uh, on governance. Uh, she famously said, remember the ladies, right? Uh, that's a letter that people know about. Um, look at the ways in which women were influencing constitutionalism on a smaller scale, uh, even before the 19th Amendment. We're actually working now uh, on a project that would spotlight the ways, the myriad ways of how women, both formally and informally, uh, largely informally in our uh, nation's history at this point, influence constitutionalism from the revolutionary period uh, to today. Um, if you have questions about that, my contact information is on the Consource About page. Email me. I can share with you what we have now in terms of resources. Um, and then give you a preview um, of what's to come. Uh, but really, I think the goal of a lot of historians right now and constitutional scholars are to bring in voices that have not historically been presented. And as those scholarly materials become more readily available, and those of us in the education space that bridge the gap between scholars and K through 12 education, we're gonna start developing resources that bring those different views to bear. Um, and I think it's actually gonna, to be honest with you, revolutionize the way we teach American history in this country. Dick. Oh, well, thank you very much, Julie. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear us? Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much. I'm just gonna come over here and say thank you on behalf of all of us here. <laughs> So thank you, Julie, and uh, I'm sure each and every one of you uh, can uh, send an email, but thanks a lot, and uh, we'll, we'll connect with you later, Julie. Uh, before we head out to our first sessions, I have a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, one, Wi-Fi. If you want to get on our Wi-Fi network, there's no password. It's just AirNet1, which sounds like it's something from the Terminator movies, uh, but I assure you it is safe and will get you uh, satisfy your Wi-Fi needs for the day. Uh, room locations. Uh, first of all, the restrooms. There are restrooms kind of down this hallway and to the left on the side there. So if you need the restroom at all in the other building, uh, they are um, behind the mural. Uh, if you have a, a, if you go over to the Air Force One building, uh, the room locations that you'll be going to today. So if you, the sessions you are going to are in the Roosevelt or Jefferson rooms, those two rooms are right over here. Uh, you can see the whiteboards in the back of the room. They're just on the other side of those. Um, so those are the Roosevelt Jefferson rooms. If you're in the Air Force One boardroom, that is across the way uh, on the second level. So you'll go in through the doors and, and make a right and it'll be over there. And if you're in the Discovery Center classroom, it's gonna be on the ground floor. Uh, for anybody who has signed up for the Discovery Center simulation this afternoon, and I believe we have the sign-up sheets over at our uh, table over there, uh, if you want to go through those, you have to sign up because we have a limited number of spaces, uh, but if you want to go through those, that is also on the first level of the other building. Second, or third, or however many points I'm making, uh, you got a passport when you came in. 
So this passport is our exhibitor passport, and we have 12 amazing organizations with lots of great resources and ideas for you. Um, if you go around and you get your passport signed off on by each of these organizations, everybody who does that will be eligible for some prizes at the end of lunch. So you have until through lunch to, uh, to get those signed off on. So once you do that, uh, you, can, you can turn those in, and we have a basket correct, uh, a basket at the Reagan Foundation um, booth that you can turn those into. And I think that is all of the housekeeping. Any other housekeeping items? No? All right. So with that, you got about 10 minutes before your first session start. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you back here.